The Adventure of English by Melvin Bragg, abridged version, book review. So this is another audiobook that I picked up at the University of Melbourne Library when I was studying there. Uh, ordinarily, I tend to steer clear of abridged versions just because I've got a certain personality. It, it bugs me that I'm missing something and I don't even know what I'm missing. Uh, but if it's an audiobook, my standards are lower, and particularly if it's a free audiobook that I can just check out for free from the university library, then I don't care. I mean, th th then it's just like a free bonus. So uh, I did this as an audiobook, I listened to it, and this is my review of it. Uh, Melvin Bragg is somebody who I believe is more famous in Britain than he is in America. I'm an American, so I only vaguely know about him. Uh, I'm, I'm, I know that he's got a BBC radio series called In Our Time, which you can listen to, some, some of the episodes you can listen to on the internet, and I have, and I found them fascinating listening, so, you know, if you're looking for listening recommendations, you can Google that. Uh, he's also done a, a number of other things. You, you can check out his Wikipedia bio. He seems like a very interesting person. This particular book is actually a companion book to a television series that was aired on the BBC, I believe, which I have not seen. I, I'm having a little bit of deja vu here, actually, because I recently reviewed a book, Monarchy, by David Starkey, which was also a companion book to a TV series on the BBC, which I also reviewed the book even though I hadn't seen the TV series, so this is the same thing all over again. This is connected to a TV series, I haven't seen the TV series, so I'm just reviewing the book and these are just my thoughts on what I listened to. Okay, my main criticisms of the book is that uh, most of what was in here I already knew, uh, and the book had a very abrupt pacing. Now, it strikes me that actually both of those criticisms could be related to the fact that I had the abridged version. Um, but I don't know, I can only review what I listened to and consider this a review of the abridged version, not a review of the whole thing. Right, so first of all, the abrupt pacing of the book. Uh, this is set right from the opening sentences of the book, where without much of an introduction at all, we're plunged right into the middle of the Germanic, Germanic invasion of England. Without any historical background at all as to what was going on in England before the Anglos and the Saxons came, or why the Anglo-Saxons, why the Anglos and the Saxons came in the first place. Uh, to quote from the opening part of the book, quote, So where did it begin? How did the billion-tongued language of modern England, first, sorry, modern English, first find its voice? When and where did it assume the form we know? How did it set out from such a remote and unlikely place on the map? to forge its spectacular success. As far as England is concerned, the language that became English arrived in the 5th century with dramatic warriors from across the sea. So, boom, you know, it sets out the questions and then just kind of rushes through some facts. Uh, and this is typical of the whole book. The author rushes from one fact to another without really letting any of the significance of it sink in. Now, the second criticism, uh, I don't know if this is really a criticism, but I, I felt like I already knew most of what was in the book uh, before I listened to it. And this is maybe per peculiar to my situation. Uh, I had, prior to this book, already read The Mother Tongue, The Story of English and How It Got That Way by Bill Bryson, uh, and The Language Instinct by Steven Pinker. Uh, both of which touched on the history and theory of English language. Um, so, if this is your first introduction to the history of English, then perhaps you'll get more out of it than I did. I, I think, I, as, I, as I've been trying to get into linguistics, I picked up a number of uh, 
history of English language books written for a popular audience. Uh, so the mother tongue was the first one, the adventure of English is the second one. Since doing the adventures of English, I picked up a couple more, uh, and I found that they had diminishing returns. Uh, and I, I, I think the problem is, in my situation, uh, I think if you're going to pick up a popular history, a popular book on the history of English, one is good. After that, they start to just kind of repeat the same things. And I, I, I think this is true for popular books, you know, you know books designed for a non-specialist audience. Uh, if you were going to get into more scholar, scholarly or thorough books, uh, then I think maybe this wouldn't be as true. Uh, but if, if you're going to pick up books that are just kind of written for a popular audience, you're going to start to see the same things repeated over and over again. Um, it's interesting though, some of the things that Melvin Bragg states as hard truth in this book are presented with more qualifications in some of the other books I've been reading. Uh, for example, uh, Melvin Bragg states that uh, the prototype Indo-European language uh, is the mother of all languages. Uh, Steven Pinker, in his book, casts a little bit of doubt on this hypothesis, but Marvin Bragg states it without any qualification. Uh, and, and there's one other thing that was interesting, uh, and this has to do with the cow-beef distinction, which I suspect you maybe already know about because it's one of those popular pieces of folk linguistics that tends to pop up a lot at you know cocktail parties or you know somebody in a bar might tell this to you as an interesting anecdote. It's it's one of those things that's fairly widespread. I'm going to recount it in. I'm going to recount it here anyways, just to give everyone sufficient background. So if you're already familiar with this, bear with me. But one of the oddities of the English language is that we tend to have separate words for the animal itself in the meat of an animal. For example, there's a cow, but we eat beef. There's pig, but we eat pork. A calf, veal, sheep, mutton, uh, etc. This is, by and large, not true of most other languages, and if you've taught English abroad, like I have, you've probably noticed this. Well, this is a source of amusement or confusion to some of your students where they have to remember a different name for the meat of an animal and for the animal itself. For example, like in Japanese or Vietnamese, or I, I think most other languages, uh, they just say meat of the cow. They don't actually have like a separate word for the cow meat, uh, as we do in English. Uh, and it's popularly thought that this distinction dates back to the Norman invasion. So, you know, in 1066 with William the Conqueror, when the Normans took over England, and then for a long period of years, the Norman aristocracy was ruling England, uh, you had one word for the actual animal itself, which, you know, the lower class English, English peasants would use, cow. Uh, but then, once the cow actually got butchered and the meat got carved up and it got presented to the Norman aristocracy at their dinner table, they would use the Norman French word to refer to the meat, uh, which was beef, which apparently comes from the Norman French. And, and that's apparently true for all the different animal meat distinctions in English. So that, that's the theory. Uh, and I think that's what's popularly uh, given in folk linguistics as the origin for why we have two different words, one for the animal and one for the meat. Um, now, I, again, I said this is probably one of those things you already knew because it, it does tend to pop up a lot in anecdotes and, you know, parties or somebody at a bar might, may have told you. Um, and it's, it's these kind of things that you probably already knew that pop up a lot in this adventure of English books. But in, interestingly enough, Bill Bryson mentions this. Uh, and then he says that there are some linguists who doubt this. Uh, he quotes one linguist who called it an enduring myth. Uh, and this particular linguist notes that back in Samuel Johnson's time, Samuel Johnson would refer to a cow, a cow by calling it a beef. Uh, so indicating that that 
if you go back a little bit in the history of the English language, that distinction between the meat and the animal was not so clear cut. That being said, uh, Bill Bryson does, after mentioning that some linguists disagree with that, he, he tends to say that the bulk of the evidence indicates that this is probably where it's from. I, I was actually, just before filming this video, I was researching this on the internet, and uh, a Google search seems to show that most of the sources do support this story. Uh, so, if, if, uh, if Mel Melvin Bragg is repeating a popular myth here, at the very least he's in good company. Uh, it, it, it does seem to be that the, the bulk of the sources do seem to support this. But I, I just thought it was interesting that there were a couple things like this, which Melvin Bragg just spots off as if they're facts, where if you read some other books, it seems like the story is more complicated. Anyway, I, I stated that I learned very little from this book, but that's overstating it. Uh, I think maybe 75% of this book I already knew, but there was maybe a quarter of the book, actually maybe as much as half of the book, really, that was new information to me. Uh, for example, the history of the English language Bible, which Melvin Bragg goes into some detail on, was completely new to me. Uh, now, the book is written by Melvin Bragg, a British author, and it seems to be aimed at a British audience. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis here on the place names of Britain, uh, which I think is of limited interest to Americans like me. Uh, but then, as the story of English expands, there are sections on American English, uh, and Australian English as well does get some attention. So, in conclusion, I, I'm not sure this book was anything earth-shattering, but Melvin Bragg is a skilled storyteller, and he's a skilled presenter, uh, and this was a pleasant enough book to listen to.